this kind of tables are very good for working with superconducting qubits at ETH. Okay, so thank you very much. <coughs> Alright, so um, okay, it's always a bit difficult to find the right spot between two good screens here. Um, so I'll just stay here like the others. So thanks for the invitation to talk a little bit about our work uh, on uh, quantum information processing with uh, uh, superconducting circuits um, that is performed at ETH. And uh, um, I guess probably some of you have uh, heard uh, Leo Di Carlo's uh, talk last night, which uh, I unfortunately missed because I've been at a, at a PhD defense of one of our students um, yesterday. And so, uh, so now you'll hear a little bit on, uh, on what our view of uh, the state of affairs is in uh, quantum computation with uh, superconducting uh, electronic circuits and uh, uh, I guess that you can check what you've learned already a lot last night on uh, this talk by recognizing some of the things that I'll be talking about here. Okay, so, so the basic idea is to use superconducting electronic circuits for or doing interesting quantum physics experiments both in, kind of, in, in, a, in the domain of quantum optics and also quantum information processing. And what we're more or less doing is we're building these uh, uh, several tens or maybe hundred of micron size uh, uh, superconducting electronic circuits that essentially behave uh, like artificial atoms. They have a discrete set of energy levels that you can address by shining uh, coherent microwave radiation on certain transitions. You can do short pulses and create uh, coherent superpositions if you want to. Uh, and one of the uh, specific aspects that I'll be uh, dwelling on a little bit today is, is how you can actually use the coherent absorption of individual photons by some of these superconducting artificial atoms to, to uh, actually mediate interactions between a set of them. And so what you see here is one of these superconducting artificial atoms in, like, embedded uh, into a chip next to some microwave frequency transmission line along which photons can propagate. Okay, so uh, even though that uh, uh, after Leo's talk, or maybe because you've heard other talks of, about the subject, uh, I'll, I'll just give you like a brief introduction of uh, why it is that we can use these electronic circuits to, to look at quantum physics questions. And, and our basic approach really is to, uh, to go and use essentially basic circuit elements like capacitors, inductors, uh, resistors, and maybe some special nonlinear elements uh, to build circuits that behave quantum mechanically. Yeah? So for example, one of the ways yeah, we could look at that, what we're trying to do is, so here's a capacitor. And we're trying to think about the situation where, where you have an, a charge on one of the plates of the capacitor. And if you think, if you live in a classical world, you could decide to put this charge on either one of the capacitor plates. Uh, but you'll never put the charge on both plates simultaneously. But, but in a quantum world, uh, uh, this is possible. And we're trying to operate these electronic circuits in a, in a regime where you can actually look at these kinds of superpositions where a single charge is on, on two plates of this capacitor simultaneously. And in quantum physics, you know how, to, how you write such a, such a situation. And here I've just written down like a pictorial representation of what a wave function for such a, such a state would look like. Um, and actually, you can, you can think about a similar problem when you, when you consider inductors in a loop. Yeah? And if you have an inductor in a loop, the currents uh, can flow, and they can flow either clockwise. Many electrons can move clockwise in, around the circuits, or they can move anti-clockwise. Uh, anti um, but classically, it's hard to imagine how they, how they move in both directions simultaneously. You know? and, and, and again, uh, you, can, you can think about that in terms of such a superposition state of, uh, of, of these two different possibilities with different amplitudes that you might want to control. And I mean, if, if, you, if you're trying to assemble your little circuit in your, in your lab on your, on your printed circuit board, you think that that's kind of a, a weird uh, way how to think about the physics that, that arises. And, and one of the sort of the fundamental questions on these circuits that has been answered in the beginning is, is how to really make sure that you can observe these kinds of effects in these circuits. And, and these kinds of effects that are those that we're going to make use of in quantum information process. Okay, so uh, um, maybe uh, on, a, on a more from a more theoretical perspective, uh, like maybe one of the most basic way how to how to understand why uh, how quantum mechanics arises in these circuits is, is to notice that uh, the two parameters that actually describe the dynamics of such a circuit are, are charge and flux. So the charge of such a capacitor plate and the magnetic flux that is generated by a current that might circulate around this loop. Yeah. And, and 
and charge and flux in these circuits uh, have the same properties as, as position and momentum in real space. Yeah? Position and momentum are conjugate variables. And in these electronic circuits, charge and flux are also conjugate variables. And so these, for these conjugate variables in quantum mechanics, we know that there are some commutation relations and some Heisenberg uncertainty relation applies between them. Yeah? And that's not only the case for position and momentum, but it's also the case for, for flux and, and charge. And so now you already uh, get a feeling that whatever electronic circuit you have, you can assemble it and write down its Hamiltonian in terms of the conjugate variables, charge and flux. And then you do, do just exactly the same that you would do with quantizing any, any physical system that you're interested in. You replace every, everything where, it's, where you write down charge by charge operator and flux by flux operator, and then you can just diagonalize it and find all the properties that you're interested in. And that's really the basic idea when you, when you think about the quantum physics of these circuits. Okay, so, so how is it that we look then in, in, uh, into these quantum electronic circuits? Uh, so um, you can now take a set of these elements and maybe uh, the simplest combination is to take an inductor and a capacitor and that forms a harmonic oscillator. Yeah, you can have charges, uh, as I mentioned on this capacitor here, and currents flowing through the inductor which generate flux. Yeah, and, and then if you, if you follow this prescription which I uh, mentioned before, you write down the Hamiltonian, you, uh, uh, you write down the Hamilton operator, uh, you can then um, uh, just find the eigen energies. And if you do that for an LC oscillator, you just find a, an equidistant set of energy levels, yeah, which are just the solutions to the harmonic oscillator uh, Hamilton. Yeah, no surprise there. Um, and so uh, one of the th ways how I will refer to kind of the excitations in these types of LC oscillators uh, uh, later is kind of, it's, it's sort of an electronic version of a photon. Yeah? You can, the, uh, the quantization of energy is h bar omega, where omega is the resonance frequency of the circuit, and you can add photons one by one to the system. Okay, so if, if everything was linear in these circuits, that would be kind of boring. You know, all the, all the energy levels are equidistantly spaced from each other, and, and that would make it hard to address transitions between individual levels. Yeah? Because one of the things that you want to, to be able to do is to, for example, prepare this, uh, this one state here, or, or superposition between zero and one, and that's actually kind of tricky if you have only classical control fields available. And there's one way out, and that's to add some nonlinearity to the circuits. So the way how you add nonlinearity in superconducting circuits is you replace this inductor uh, by uh, a superconducting inductor that has some nonlinearity. And the Josephson tunnel junction, which is just a, a, a tunnel junction between two superconducting materials separated by a little tunnel barrier, behaves like an ideal nonlinear inductor. So here is this ideal nonlinear inductor. It has no dissipation, but it has some nonlinear dependence of the of the inductance uh, of of this element on the flux that is stored in it. And so, therefore, you put this nonlinear term into your Hamiltonian, and obviously, then you will not find a linear energy level spectrum anymore. But you will find a, a nonlinear energy level spectrum where you now have a set of energies, eigenenergies that are non -equidist not equidistantly spaced from each other anymore. Uh, and in this situation, you can now, for example, shine a coherent uh, tone onto this transition between the ground state and the first excited state. And, and if you adjust the time properly, you can prepare the excited state or you can prepare a superposition between these two states without interacting with these higher states. Okay, and, and, and these kind of nonlinear circuits I, I would refer to as electronic or artificial atoms um, in this context. Okay, and, and, and this, this kind of subject, um, how to make these circuits behave quantum mechanically, has been worked on uh, for a fair bit in the last almost 15 years or so now. And, and so you have to think about, so these are the, the basic uh, quantum mechanical properties of these circuits, but how do you make them apparent in your experiment? And, uh, and there's three things that you have to consider. So first of one of them is you need to avoid dissipation. So no resistors in your circuits because the, the resistance will lead to energy relaxation from higher states to lower states. So that's maybe one reason why you might want to use superconductors. Um, the typical energy level uh, separations here are on the order of eight, or I mean, on the, on the order of h bar omega. The characteristic frequencies are set by the sizes of these inductances and the capacitances, and those are typically lead to oscillator frequencies on the order of a few gigahertz or maybe a few tens of gigahertz. And if you convert that to a to a thermal energy or so, that corresponds the gigahertz corresponds to roughly 50 millikelvin, and uh, so that's just h bar omega divided by Boltzmann's constant, and, and so that tells you that if you want to prepare such a system in the ground state, you have to cool the circuit down to a very low temperature. And that also tells you if you try to operate the circuit at room temperature, it will be just in, in a 
highly excited state, you know, and, and we can't do any coherent quantum manipulation. <coughs> so if you if you use if you avoid resistance and if you operate these circuits at low temperature and you control their interaction with the environment, you can actually look at these quantum mechanical properties. And by now, there's actually really a, a, I would I would say there's probably a few dozen labs around the world who master how to do these electronic circuits and, and how to uh, investigate different properties of them, both for basic physics experiments but also for quantum information processing. Uh, and maybe at this point, since we're in Oxford here, I should point out that, uh, that one of uh, our collaborators, uh, Peter Lee, who worked at ETH with us on, on a number of different uh, projects, he now is also setting up his own lab uh, at Oxford to, to investigate the physics of these kinds of circuits in, in various contexts. So if you're interested, you should probably talk to him about it. Okay, and, and, and these circuits have interesting applications, both for basic science and for real applications. And one of them is, is for example, which probably Leo has mentioned. Um, you can use, you can build circuits like that, that which uh, which will operate as, for example, quantum limited amplifiers, where you can do very good detection. And that is maybe also interesting outside of the context of quantum information. Okay, as, as, as I said on my introductory slides already, uh, so what will be important for the work that I'll be presenting to you is, is kind of how we bring these linear oscillators and nonlinear oscillators together to look at interactions between them, to look at interactions between photons and, and, and individual artificial atoms. So how does that proceed in a very generic view? Yeah? So usually you have a two-level system, like an NV center or so, and, uh, or an atom or an ion, and, and you, you, you're trying to send photons past them, and you're trying to make this photon be absorbed by this atom. But usually that's pretty hard because the, uh, the, uh, the fields generated by this little photon are small and the dipole moment uh, of the atom is pretty small. And therefore the interaction rate between this photon and the atom is, is typically quite small. And, and you have to play some tricks to make this photon interact strongly with the individual two-level system. So here it's maybe important to point out that the typical size of the dipole moment is just the electron charge times the blow radius if, if you consider an outlier. Okay, so there's small interactions, so this is hard, and, and so what you do to, uh, if you want to now use photons and these two-level systems for quantum information processing, you want to fix this problem, and, and uh, quantum opticians and atomic physicists have told, told us one approach to fix this kind of problem. And, and that is uh, to, to confine your qubit and a photon in, in, inside a cavity, so that, uh, and, and I'll point out uh, in, in a second how this works. And the second approach to, uh, to deal with this problem is to just try to make quantum mechanical systems that have very large dipole moments and try to uh, engineer the properties of these photons to have larger electric fields. And if, both, if you can increase both of them, you can have large photon uh, uh, two-level system interactions. And that's what is possible in, in electronic circuits. So this cavity QED trick is shown here. So here you have again this, uh, this two-level system that I've mentioned. You have now two highly reflective mirrors. And if you have a single photon in between these mirrors, the single photon will bounce in back and forth many, many, many times. And then it has more, uh, uh, it just has an increased uh, uh, total probability then to, to be absorbed by this atom. And it can actually be absorbed uh, uh, coherently. And the atom can re-emit coherently that same photon into this cavity. And, and, and when this uh, exchange process of the single excitation between the atom and the cavity, which is uh, proportional to this uh, coupling constant G here, is much, much larger than the rate at which you lose photons from the cavity, or the rate at which the atom might be coherent, you can actually look at the coherent physics of this. And so what, what we uh, now have started to look at now quite some time ago is how to do this in superconducting electronic circuits. And, and so here's the superconducting electronic circuit version of this approach. Now the cavity here is replaced by this kind of transmission line resonator that Leo had pointed out. So you have a, essentially it's a, it's a, a strip of metal um, on a chip that has a certain length and there's a certain weight propagation velocity along this chip. And so this, this length here sets up a resonant mode uh, with a certain frequency. And here the lambda, the full wavelength mode is shown. Uh, and now you can place a superconducting qubit, one of these unharmonic oscillators, into an anti-node of, of that wave. And here it actually can, can interact strongly with photons that might populate this mode here. And so, so why is this, this good? So this is good because these superconducting artificial atoms can actually have dipole moments that are uh, somewhere between 10 to the 3 and 10 to the 6 times larger than the dipole moments of, of, a, of a typical atom. 
Uh, so it, it, they're just very good antennas for microwave radiation. And one of the ways how to look at it, it's just a, it's just a very large object. It's a 300 micron size object that, uh, if you design it right, can still be quantum mechanically coherent, but also absorb photons very well. And at the same time, you kind of uh, confine the photons in this small volume, like which uh, uh, is just along this length here, and, and this very small lateral volume. And you kind of confine the energy of the photon to a so small volume that actually the field that the photon generates is large. And therefore, you get a large single photon field, superconducting artificial atom interaction, because this is a, a good dipole moment, and the photons have a large field. OK, and, and, and uh, this is a circuit version of, of quantum electrodynamics, a circuit version of, of this, uh, this approach, which is well known. OK, so, so how do you demonstrate that? Uh, um, um, that this works. Um, so, so the first thing that you can do is you can actually do an experiment in which you're trying to bring this uh, uh, this artificial atom here into resonance with photons inside the cavity. And there's a little energy level diagram that you can draw. So here, this zero and one are the uh, zero and one photon state of the cavity, and D and E are the two states of the of the two level system. And if you now bring 0 and 1 and G and D into resonance with each other and there's some dipole interaction, you will actually uh, coherently couple these two states and you will form this doublet here, which is called the vacuum Rami uh, mode split. And so this doublet forms uh, uh, two new eigenstates, like a coherent superposition of, of having the excitation of the atom or in the two-level system and having the excitation of the atom. Okay, this you can now measure by going from the joint ground state where the chip is cold to this excitation doublet here. So here's the resonance frequency of the, of the cavity. This is the, the transition frequency of the superconducting qubit, which you can tune by applying some magnetic flux to it. And then at this point, you do spectroscopy, and you find two very narrow spectroscopic lines, which just correspond to these two states here. And so, uh, and, and the separation of these two lines just gives you a direct measure of the coupling strength. So if you've made the circuit, you can actually check how strong this individual photon is coupled to this individual two-level system by just a fairly basic uh, spectroscopic measurement here. And you find that that the coupling strength is, is quite significant in comparison to the line width. And so for this particular sample, which is now not state of the art anymore, but one of the earlier experiments, you could actually uh, exchange a single, you could absorb a single photon about 300 times in the atom and re emit it into the cavity before it would decohere. And now with the increased coherence times, this will work much better. And then you can use photons in these qubits for shuffling information around the more complex. Okay, you can look uh, a bit more at the details of that and not only look at, this anti at, at these two uh, levels here, but you can look at the anti-crossing and measure it and also understand it in detail by modeling the system uh, theoretically. Or you could just uh, look at the coherent oscillations when you prepare the system in the excited state initially and then instead of just seeing in the, in the energy domain uh, these, these two states here, you can look in the time domain and then you will see these vacuum around the oscillations which indicate the same Okay, and, and, and this kind of then started this, this field of circuit quantum electrodynamics where, where, you, where you could use these strong interactions to look in detail at how photons interact with two-level systems in, in various situations. And you can, in these circuits, you can see things like the lamp shift, the renormalization of the energy levels due to the vacuum fluctuations. Or you can do all sorts of, of single photon nonlinear uh, uh, quantum optics experiments. Uh, you can do uh, efficient detection and maybe most important for today's talk, you can now use these cavities and, and superconducting qubits to, to realize quantum <laughs> algorithms, generate entangled states, and, and make use of this infrastructure for quantum information processing. Okay, so uh, um, so in a, in a quantum information processor, um, you, you'll then try to make use of, of these nice properties. So now a quantum information processor, we essentially have a set of qubits, which are these superconducting nonlinear oscillators. They have pretty good coherence times. We can uh, uh, initialize these qubits by just cooling them down, and then we can use coherent microwave pulses to excite them and put them into coherent superposition states. We can realize two qubit interactions by exchanging photons between individual qubits. And this photon exchange can happen non-locally through using this cavity as a bus, yeah? because now if you have these three qubits, for example, you could think about it this way, that this photon emit, this qubit emits a photon into the bus and then it can get reabsorbed by the other qubit. And like any, any one of the guys that's coupled to this bus here can actually talk to each other in a non-local way. And then in the end, you can uh, develop uh, uh, interesting ways how to actually perform a, a, a readout of all these qubits. And so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about two experiments that we've done recently.
links in here, and one of them uh, is on the Toffoli gate, which relates to uh, um, um, the possibility of doing error correction, which probably Leo has uh, uh, talked about a little bit in, in his talk, I don't believe. Um, and, and also, if there's enough time, I'll talk uh, to you a little bit about uh, some first step towards doing a teleportation experiment. Okay, so here's our, our quantum processor platform with three qubits. Yeah, I mean, if you're a computer scientist, you say, okay, three qubits, where's the processor read? Really? But, uh, but that's the way how people talk about it, to keep themselves happy, I guess, for all the effort that they spent on making these, these uh, chips, which is kind of really a challenge. Yeah, and and it's, it will be a big challenge to go to 10 and even hundreds. And, uh, but that's the first step. But, but it's, a, it's a process in, in the sense that it has all the basic elements. You can do single qubit manipulation, two qubit interactions, readout, and you can run little toy algorithms to, to check that everything works. So here's our architecture. It has this resonator here. It has three qubits coupled to it. Every one of these three qubits has three control parameters, a static field, a pulse magnetic field, and a microwave drive line. Um, and, and you can read out the, the states of all these qubits by sending microwave photons through this resonator and detecting them with this amplifier here. Okay, the coherence times in this particular circuit are, are are on the order of, of uh, a few hundred nanoseconds, maybe up to a microsecond. But rather recently, in the last year or so, there was actually uh, lots of progress on improving these coherence times, so there's good hope that, that one can realize these circuits with much, with much better coherence properties. Oops. <laughs> All right, so now I've given it away already. Here's, here's the, uh, uh, the, actual, uh, uh, the actual chip that realizes this resonator here. Uh, so here you see the resonator. There's one qubit there. Uh, second qubit, third qubit. Here you have a, a zoom in on one of the qubits in this area, and, uh, and a zoom in on, on this Josen junctions here, which I've mentioned, which we did. So the nonlinear inductor are these two really sub-micron size tunnel junctions that you see in this area here. And uh, so now, since the last talk had some biology in it, I thought I, I also need some biology in my talk. And, uh, uh, and it seemed that there was an ant passing by our clean room, and, uh, and so uh, this ant somehow got stuck on our chip. And uh, so this is an antenna uh, of one of these ants, and here, here you uh, here you actually see uh, one of our superconducting qubits, and, and that gives you a size scale. Yeah. So uh, maybe the the qubits are big in comparison to atoms, but anything else uh, that you're used to, they're they're rather small. And you might wonder uh, uh, why why we spend time to look at things like that, but but our clean room actually has a rule that. Uh, have to spend some time on an SEM microscope to learn how to operate it properly before they can really do device fabrication. Actually, one of our students, but without asking me, decided that he should uh, look at uh, one of these ads and one of the and it results in some quite nice uh, pictures. Mm -hmm. Those were taken by glass pictures, so it's, you're probably the first one to see it. So if you zoom out a little bit, uh, <laughs> uh, so here's uh, that's the head of the ant. Uh, Gives you sort of an interesting size scale, and, uh, and 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 this is actually the smallest ant that we could commercially find. <laughs> <laughs> the biologists find these, yeah, and, and, and it was all done properly. So we uh, so the students looked at how to deal with these ants uh, properly, and uh, uh, they were dried and then gold coated, and, uh, uh, all with the uh, state of the art uh, biotechnology. Okay, so this gives you the size scale of these, uh, but otherwise. It's Okay, so, so now you have uh, now you have one of these qubits here, and you can control it uh, its quantum mechanical properties. And so, for example, if you do single qubit control, one of the things that you do is you you drive Rabi oscillations on the single qubit, yeah. And so this is a Rabi oscillation that gets driven on the single qubit, and what you see here is the block sphere and the single qubit density matrix, the real part and the imaginary part. And at some initial time, you start in the ground state, and then you just Rabi oscillate. And, uh, and now you can just stop the Rabi oscillation at any time to make, prepare a superposition state, to prepare an excited state. And if you wish to, uh, uh, to rotate about another axis, you can uh, prepare a superposition state with a different phase. And this also already shows you that you can actually determine the state of the qubit by measuring transmission through the resonator. And these density matrices were actually reconstructed by these transmission measurements through the resonator. So that shows you okay, that you have good single qubit control. Uh, and a uh, good single qubit measurement. Okay, so uh, um, we we'll use a, uh, like an interaction for uh, realizing a C0 gate or two qubit interaction based on, uh, on a proposal that relates to uh, a work by Frederick Schwab. And, and then uh, we, it's, 
it's uh, more or less the same as uh, Leo Di Carlo has uh, first showed how to use in, in the context of superconducting circuits. And so uh, what we do is here, here we consider two qubits, a qubit A and a qubit B, and, and to call these qubits in, 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 in some sense is already wrong. Yeah? Our superconducting circuits not only have two levels, there's not only a zero and a uh, ground state in the first excited state, it's not a spin one half particle, but it has higher excited states. And in first order, you would think, oh, that comes in the way, uh, and, and I really don't want it. But you can also think of how you make use of these higher excited states. And Frederick Schwab and, and, and Leo have then found this neat way how to actually use the second excited state of one qubit to mediate a two qubit interaction. So here you see all the two qubit states considering uh, 0 and 1 in, in qubit B and considering 0, 1 and 2 in qubit A. So the way how you proceed now is you actually bring qubit uh, A and B into the first excited state each. Then you change magnetic field which tunes the transition frequencies from some high value to some lower value. And you see that the first thing that happens is actually that the state 2, 0 gets resonant with the state 1, 1. And if these two states are resonant, they can actually exchange a little bit of energy through photon exchange through this cavity. And what then happens is, uh, similar to the vacuum Rabi mode splitting, your 1, 1 state can actually oscillate to the 2, 0 state. Uh, and that will then uh, give you uh, this transformation on your state with a, with a certain phase factor. And then when you come back to the 1, 1 state, uh, you actually get a phase factor of minus 1. Yeah? And this makes a controlled phase gate. because now only this 1, 1 state actually in this process accumulates a phase of minus 1 and all the other states uh, remain unchanged. And uh, so this kind of uh, physical interaction then leads to a controlled phase gate that you can then use to, to realize the schema. So here's your, your matrix for the controlled phase gate and, and the symbol that we use typically in these, uh, uh, in these quantum circuits that we designed to represent it and that this will uh, reappear in the later parts. And this uh, uh, controlled phase gate uh, is a two-qubit interaction, and when you use it together with single-qubit uh, gates, you can actually realize any quantum operation that you want on a, on a set of qubits. Okay, so maybe one thing that you should do is now that I have shown you how to uh, realize such a controlled two-qubit interaction, you need to check how it works. And, and one of the ways how to check how it works is, is to do process tomography on this controlled phase gate. And in process tomography, you essentially take uh, an input state of all, rho and, and you look at how your process uh, transforms it into an output state rho prime. And there's this technique uh, uh, that is called process tomography where you, where you essentially decompose the whole process uh, into the uh, single qubit operator basis. So you express the whole process in terms of the Pauli the identity and the Pauli operators. And what you extract then is, is a so-called chi matrix, and this chi matrix you can use to, to represent uh, the process. And you can do this measurement, and the, uh, the dash line here are actually the, uh, the elements of the chi matrix that you would expect. And when we do the experiment, we see that we get these colored bars, and you see that the colored bars are not as high as the, as the outlines here, and that relates to, or that expresses the, uh, the limited fidelity that this gauge has in our and currently, the fidelity for, for this experiment uh, that we did sometime summer last year uh, was, was on the order of, of, of 86%. Uh, percent. So, so not perfect, yeah, but, but good enough to, to do some, some algorithms and also to create some entangled states beyond the classical. Again, then the first thing that we did is also to just see that it works, and uh, we repeated uh, like an experiment that Leo also did. Uh, the generation of three qubit entangled states. And three qubit entangled states you can now just create by having your three, using your three qubit registers, starting out in the ground states, doing single qubit rotations, doing two, uh, 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 two qubit operations, two two qubit C phase gates, and some more single qubit operations, and then perform tomography on all this register. And when you do that, you get a, a, a density matrix for this GHZ state, uh, for the coherent superposition between 0, 0, 0, and 1, 1, 1, uh, which in this case has a fidelity of, of 80%, which again shows you that you can now combine these basic elements into a more complicated circuit and, uh, uh, and see that they work, and, and look at entangled states uh, and uh, try to investigate them properly. Okay, so, so with these two tools at hand, uh, then we started out to look at, uh, at, a, at a three qubit gate, which is the so called Toffoli gate, and uh, it was proposed by Tommaso Toffoli, uh, well, the computer scientist, who you know much better than I do, um, as, as a gate 
to reversible computation. Yeah? And, uh, so because this is kind of reversible, uh, um, and, and you can uh, realize these topoly gates on a quantum information processor, um, this, this already tells you that you can probably do every, every classical computation that you want to do on, on a quantum processor as well. And so here is this representation of this topoly gate. And the topoly gate is a controlled control plot gate. And it actually changes the state of this uh, uh, target you would see here, if and only if the, uh, the two control qubits are, are in a certain uh, state. And typically, you choose these two control qubits to be in state 1, 1. But we implemented it for technical reasons for the situation where, where the qubit A is in state 0 and qubit B is in state 1. OK, why well, is totally interesting uh, um, for reversible classical computation and quantum computers? Um, but maybe most importantly, for some of the basic quantum error correction schemes, you can use these software gates. Uh, and it's sort of the next level of complexity in, in trying to work with n gates. OK, so, so what is the basic way to realize a Toffoli gate? Yeah, so, I mean, one of, one of the basic approaches or one of the reasons why you like quantum computation is because you, one, one can decompose anything that one would like to do into single qubit operations and two qubit operations. And so now if you look at the Stoffoli gate, you can compose, decompose it into single and two qubit operations, uh, but this is not very efficient. Yeah? So if you uh, decompose it into a single qubit operation that controls knots, you need 60 knot scale gates and, and 10 single qubit gates. And so with our current uh, state of the art, of the fidelities of, of the individual gates, this is kind of hard to do and, and, and doesn't work uh, uh, with very good fidelity. But now you can think about using tricks, yeah, go beyond this two qubit uh, and, and single qubit uh, gates. And, and the first inspiration for these tricks were actually uh, uh, came to us by, by, by an experiment that was done in a, in a photon context, where they used different levels to hide some of the qubit states that were relevant in this Toffoli gate to make the decomposition into, uh, uh, into gates of the Toffoli gate much more efficient. And, uh, and so we came up then with, with one of the ways how you can decompose this uh, Toffoli gate uh, into two qubit and single qubit gates more, more efficiently. And I'll try to explain that to you briefly. So we have again three qubits, A, B, and C. So here are all their initial states. So the first thing that we do actually, and, and you'll see it in a second why that is important, uh, we apply some swap gate between qubits A and B. So uh, when qubit A and B are in the state 1, 1, we'll, we'll move that to actually to state 2, 0. And so that you see uh, uh, down here. So the, um, the two states with 1, 1 actually go to 2, 0 or uh, 2, 0, 1. Okay, and then we do a, a controlled phase gate on qubits B and C. And this controlled phase gate uh, now actually uh, puts a minus sign in front of this 0, 1 state. Yeah? So 0, 1 goes to minus 0, 1. And, uh, so why was this hiding procedure uh, um, um, now important? Oh, okay, sorry, I explained it wrong. Uh, so so one one goes to so zero one one, where it's important that the two last qubits are are in state one goes to minus zero one one right? because this C phase gate operates on, on qubits B and C. But there's another state which has uh, <coughs> two ones on qubits B and C, and, and that's this one. And we want to avoid that this one actually also picks up a phase. And what we do for that is we, we just change the state by this high gate process in the state I201, and, and therefore the C phase gate doesn't act uh, on this one here. And then in the last step, we can actually undo this by, uh, uh, by, by swapping the states of qubit A and B uh, again, and recover that phases. And what you see in the end that you only get a, a, like a single phase on one of these states, which actually is a control control phase gate, which you can then uh, um, turn into a topology gate by adding two single qubit operations here. Two single qubit rotations and turn this gate here into a top of And so now if you look at that, there's now actually uh, three two qubit interactions and two single qubit interactions. And, and that's much more efficient for us to do than, than this, this much more complicated uh, composition. It also leads to better fidelity in the end. And things like that will also be uh, uh, practical when, uh, or, or useful when you're trying to build more complicated circuits. Try to make use of the, of the possibilities that we have with the other levels of the circuits. Okay, so, so this is a more efficient decomposition of the top of the gate and the realization of the circuits using the C-based gate. 
The first thing that you can do then is you can just measure the truth table, which you see here. So this is the truth table of the top bully gate, and usually if, if it's controlled by 1-1 one, one in the first two qubits, you would uh, see some change here, but we've set it up that it's controlled by the 0-1 of the first two qubits. So this is the typical truth table for top bully gate. But this doesn't tell you about the coherences, and if you want to look into the coherences as well, the reality of this truth table is, is uh, 76%. But if you want to look into the coherences as well, you, you should again do, uh, or one of the ways how to analyze this is then again do process tomography and, and determine this chi matrix. And so here's a, uh, here's a measurement of this chi matrix, and then it starts to be complicated already, a, the, the operator decomposition starts to be large, and you have to do a lot of measurements to actually characterize this. Um, this top of the gate here, and you see that, uh, again, with uh, some fidelity, you actually uh, get the chi matrix that is similar to, to the ideal one. And you can then determine the fidelity you know, for this, and the fidelity is roughly 70%. So there's maybe a, a so these top body gates uh, then work yeah, uh, this way, and, and are ready to be used, for example, for error correction. But one of the things that we have actually investigated in, in, in the context of these more complicated uh, operations is how to do um, better characterization of how well the quantum processor works while trying to, to reduce the experimental overhead. And, and probably many of the computer scientists know that that is actively uh, uh, looked at now, like how to characterize these uh, processes more efficiently. And we've actually uh, used the Monte Carlo process certification uh, technique in, uh, to, to independently uh, characterize the, uh, the fidelity of this process with a much reduced effort. And this independent method here actually re, uh, resulted in, in a compatible fidelity, but with significantly less measurements to be performed. And I think such techniques will, will become more and more important in the future when we're trying to analyze more complicated uh, quantum algorithms in an efficient way. Because now if you, if you think about trying to uh, do the, the chi matrix for, you know, for your quantum computer, for example, with eight qubits or so, you, that will actually be hard to do the classical process in that Okay, so uh, um, so we've realized this Toffoli gate uh, and looked at certified it with this Monte Carlo process certification approach. Uh, and I should point out that there were two other experiments that did this uh, kind of uh, in parallel with us. Uh, and one is by the group of Don Martinez at UC Santa Barbara, uh, where they also realized Toffoli gate, but only with two qubits and using some resonator states uh, for the third qubit. Uh, and, and because of that limitation, they couldn't be uh, fully measure the process uh, matrix. But the experiment that Leo has uh, certainly talked to you about at Yale has also done the Toffoli gate in a, in a, yet in a different way from, uh, from ours, and then has also been able already to use this gate for, for showing the to the error Okay, um, so I guess my time is almost uh, over, two minutes. And, uh, two minutes, so, so I'll, I'll not really have time to, to tell you a lot of details about, about teleportation, but we have this three qubit uh, uh, um, Processor, processor, this three qubit uh, <coughs> toy architecture that we can use. And so, if, with three qubits in principle, you can think about doing teleportation. And so, you're Alice and Bob are trying to communicate, and you're essentially, as all of you know, you're trying to, using an entangled pair, you're trying to, to move an unknown state from, uh, to map an unknown state from Alice to Bob. Uh, using some coherent manipulation, this entangled pair, some coherent manipulation, measurement, and Okay, um, and so the typical circuit which uh, uh, one then looks at, uh, which you can look up at Niels and Chuang or elsewhere, we have your three qubits here. In the first step, you create an entangled pair between qubits B and C. And then you do the C0 and the Hardamard gate, and uh, you do two single shot readouts at the end, and then the readouts get communicated, or the results of these measurements get communicated to, to the third party. Uh, who then has to do some operations on their qubit to actually turn this uh, teleported qubit back into the right basis. And so Leo has probably talked about the developments on, on this kind of readout end of things uh, and the feed forward end of things. Uh, but for us, currently, this, uh, this, this task uh, uh, was too hard to do single shot readout and the feed forward. And so we, we tried to look at, at kind of the coherent part of this teleportation process. And so we've uh, implemented the steps one and two uh, 
in, in this way here and have looked at the, uh, at the properties of the three qubit entangled state that get generated after the coherent part of the teleportation process by doing three two qubit tomography. And by looking at this uh, uh, full density matrix of this three qubits, you can actually learn how good the coherent part of your teleportation circuit works. Um, and, and this is the first step towards characterizing what needs to be done uh, uh, for the full-fledged teleportation, which will require the single-shot readout and this Okay, and so I, I don't have uh, time to show you what we've done there in more detail, but it's, uh, it's discussed in this PRL that appeared uh, in January. Okay, so then to just wrap it up. Um, so we're currently working with uh, quantum computing circuits that include three qubits. Uh, we're pretty good single qubits, and they're getting better uh, every time that, uh, that you listen to one of these talks. And in particular, in the last year or so, there was another 100-fold improvement in the coherence time of these, yeah, which is very significant. I think by now people, we, the community knows how to do good single qubit operations with fidelities that go beyond 99%. It's also pretty decent uh, uh, two qubit manipulations that also get better because of the increased coherence times. And the combination of, of these and readouts then has allowed us and others to really test most of the basic elements for these quantum information processes. We'll discussed in some more detail uh, the ingredients for realizing the stop fully gate. Uh, mentioned this teleportation circuit, even though I didn't have really time to go into the details of that. And, and I think the, the challenges to, to go beyond that are really to improve coherence times, and that's lots of progress, and to really address scalability questions in these circuits. Yeah? How, how, how do you go uh, to larger circuits, um, keep the error thresholds low, and, and while implementing uh, some error correction schemes? For, for some of these, realizing single shot uh, uh, readout and feedback is uh, important. Uh, and obviously, one, one of the aspects that is also important for us to, to still kind of think about what interesting problems are there to solve at, at the current level. Yeah? And because there, there, will be, there will be quite a while between now, where we can work on kind of toy systems, until we can really solve problems uh, that you couldn't solve on a classical computer. So, so I think to think, to put more effort into thinking about what you could actually do uh, with, with a system that has anywhere between, sort of, say, five and, and maybe 50 qubits that is, that is interesting is also a, a good sort of theoretical challenge or conceptual challenge for, for, for people, I think, in the whole field to think about what we can do along these lines to, to keep this as interesting as it has been until now. Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and, and these are the guys at ETH who, who work on that, and, uh, and in case you have uh, students interested uh, in this kind of field, uh, we're looking for <laughs> postdoc and PhD students, and, uh, but if you're from, if you're local, you should also check out Peter's lab. Uh, with, uh, okay, thank you very much. for either the photon and the cavities and, 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 and the excitations in the qubits, I mean, they were different, but not drastically different, and they were limited by the same sort of physics, yeah? or by similar sort of physics. So now engineering the properties of the qubits has different constraints from engineering the properties of these cavities. Yeah? And so therefore, maybe, in certain sense, with these cavities, you can maybe you have some more flexibility to, to use other geometries or, or use modes that couple less to the surfaces of these cavities, yeah? whereas 
maybe the qubits you're more limited to avoid. I mean, so I should say that one of the loss uh, mechanisms is actually defects on the surfaces which, which matter. And if you can reduce coupling to defects on the surfaces, that increases coherence time, both for cavities and for qubits. And I, th I think the strong aspect about, about cavities is, um, is, is the fact that they're non-local and that they can mediate these couplings. So to have cavities is, is probably good. And, and I could also imagine how in the future may, maybe you can solve these coherence problems for cavities easier than, than for the qubits. So, so I think it, it's, it's definitely a valuable thing to think about whether you want to use the cavities for storage. Yeah? Because I mean, even from very old experiments, one knows that if you're really, really careful with the surfaces, you can make microwave frequency cavities with cubes in, in the extent, excess of a few billion, yeah? which people are kind of slowly catching up on. Rediscovering things that were known before, probably from, I mean, if you're from the ESR community or so, thinking about 3D cavities, and probably we're re rediscovering something that, that you knew already before. Thanks. So on your last graph, you had a list of future challenges. Could you say a few words about each of those? Um, on the last graph, on the last graph. This one? Yeah. Um, availability of wireless is a problem. <laughs> um, so the, the improvement of the coherence times, I, I think that for, for some time it had it had not gotten the amount of attention it deserved, I, I, I would say, because I think the, like the, the physicists, and that probably includes us, uh, uh, we're, we're trying to see how interesting problems you could solve with the, with the architecture and the coherence times that you have. have yeah? and, and, and that's why we didn't, like our lab personally, our lab didn't work very hard on improving these coherence times. But then you will run into a limit of what you can do. Yeah? And, and, and it became clear that you need to really carefully think about that. And these developments of 3D cavities um, for uh, using these uh, um, both in quantum computation but also to understand materials properties better w was definitely very good and it has led to, to, to a hundredfold increase uh, of the coherence times and, and I think just continued experiments on materials related questions of, of that sort and thinking about the engineering uh, challenges in these circuits will has the potential to further increase this coherence time so I think that's, that's really an import, very important issue um, because probably the, the on what matters in the end is the ratio of coherence times to manipulation times. Yeah, and the manipulation times currently, I would say, are somehow limited to the nanosecond time scale, just because of price of electronics that you can, that you can afford to 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 buy for for doing these things. Yeah, I mean, it will scale badly if you're trying to do picosecond time scale manipulations on these circuits, and then there's also some physics problems uh, that arise. So the scalability questions. I think currently is the, the, the main problem is, is not to make a, a, a system with many many elements you know? so that's why microfabrication is good so you can go to a clean room and make a system with many elements but to maintain control over the coherent quantum mechanics is, is the big challenge to, to really understand the cross couplings between all your elements for example when we try to do a more complicated experiment with n qubits yeah, we kind of have, and we have a control line that tries to control one qubit. There's a little bit of crosstalk to to another, to another qubit or to another element, and we have to understand these unwanted interactions and try to get rid of them in a in, in, in a in a meaningful way. And and if we're able to do that, I think the kind of the the, the physical scalability to just make more is not the real challenge, but to, to keep keep everything working at the level that we are used to at, at with small numbers. That will be the real challenge, in my opinion, and maybe I don't know. Maybe Leo can say something. Maybe he, di he disagrees. A question about that. So one of the uh, issues in superconducting integrated circuits is the uniformity of the junctions. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah. So how do you see that playing into scaling? Yeah, that's 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 one of these one of the aspects. Uh, so so currently. Um, what this requires is so currently all the elements are made in a way that they're tunable. So every element needs kind of a tuner that takes care of this fact that they don't come out all, all the same or they don't come out exactly at the frequency that you want. 
And so frequently what you do is you have a little tune at every one of these elements, and that's kind of not good for scalability. But there's also approaches where you're trying to, to maybe not be too critical about the exact properties of the individual qubit, but maybe select them. Yeah? That's for example, IBM has, a, has, a, has an approach where they, or the 3D cavities lend themselves to maybe swap out qubits individually, and you can probably get by uh, um, this. But, but the fact that they, I mean, that they, they come out differently for every one of our experiments, but currently we're able to hand, deal with it because we have individual controls. Sorry. On, on each one of them. Also regarding scalability, one question. Is there any hope for uh, non-locality? So for remote? Yeah. Is, is there, let's say, is there anything on the horizon or is it just impossible? No, I, I, I think... Um, mm, mm, um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah. I, I think it's not easy, but, uh, but if, you, if you wanted to do a, a, a loophole-free test of bell inequalities with superconducting circuits, it will require some effort, but it's not impossible. I think, uh, and because everything is fast, I, I think you can probably separate them space-like, yeah, in a space-like way. You need but a you have to really want to. Between them or? But I think that's not a. That's only a. That, I mean, only that's only a practical problem. And, and, and if you, if somebody was sufficiently interested, <laughs> and, and 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 there are some students who are sufficiently interested, I, I think we could probably at least give it a try, which is not like totally. Um, yeah, and then the, um, um, yeah, the, the feedback is an electronics challenge, and, and I think we'll, we'll see it coming. I, I think there's lots of FPGA and fast electronics around, around and it's also helped by this long coherence times uh, qubits. And, and I'm, I mean, Leo has talked about it, and we're working on that, and, and, and I'm sure this will happen, having feedback and, and closing the feedback loop fast. Uh, will happen. We were also working on electronics uh, for that, and, uh, uh, and definitely, uh, uh, yeah, we need we need to uh, continue uh, solving interesting problems while we're developing these, this technology to a level that it can maybe solve generic problems, yeah. and, uh, um, and and that will require some some help by by theorists and uh, identifying. Problems that we can address, maybe not more efficiently in these quantum computers, but at least in an interesting complementary way to, to to traditional kind of analysis methods. Yeah, I mean, currently you can still say, okay, anything that anybody has done with a quantum computer, you can just put on a classical computer and simulate it, and it will be cheaper and faster. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but we, but, but I think there's good hope that we'll go, that we'll reach a limit that is beyond that. But it will take some extra effort. Good, uh, let's thank Andreas and Andreas again.